Once upon a time, there lived a beautiful boat princess. Then one day... She met her Prince Charming, who took her to his castle. Welcome home, baby! And they lived happily ever after. Go overboard with Goldie Horn and Kurt Russell. I don't belong here. In 15 minutes. Before that on BBC One, the main evening news with Michael Burke. Northern Ireland's first terrorist bomb for nearly two years has wrecked a hotel at Inniskillen. The IRA says it wasn't them. A leaked report says an American bomber crash caused widespread nuclear contamination around Greenham Common. And Damon Hill goes for a spin at Silverstone and loses ground in the race for the championship. Good evening. A terrorist bomb midway through another night of violence in Northern Ireland has done yet more damage to the province's faltering peace process. It went off outside a hotel holding a wedding reception near Enniskillen. Seventeen people were injured, but there'd been a warning and none were seriously hurt. It was the first terrorist bombing in Northern Ireland for nearly two years. The IRA say they didn't do it. A wedding party, families on weekend fishing trips and tourists from Ireland and Germany. The Killy Hevelin Hotel was an attractive place. The wedding guests were just about to take the floor for the last dance. Fifteen minutes later, the hotel was in ruins. Just fifteen minutes ticking by from the warning phone call to a huge explosion. For over 200 people, some families with children asleep upstairs to get out. When the bomb went off, the only reaction that I heard was uh, from some children. Uh, they, they screamed for their daddy, the three wee girls screamed for their daddy, they were with their mother, they screamed for their daddy, and the daddy had just got separated from them. Uh, and the wee girl came running down the hill screaming for her daddy, and I caught her in my arms, and, and she said her daddy was up at the top of the hill uh, at the car park, so I went up, and I met him coming down. A four-wheel drive vehicle was parked right outside the front door just before midnight. Ninety seconds elapsed from the last of the guests leaving the building to the bomb detonating. The front of the hotel was ripped off, floors collapsed, over two dozen cars wrecked, and shrapnel hurtled a hundred yards towards the guests. The management told us to move further back, so we had to ride over, sort of up into a big hedge and grassy bank and down the other side, which is quite steep. And there was people, two men in wheelchairs, and many people of all ages that were quite shocked. And 40 people were taken to hospital, 17 treated for minor injuries and three detained. The bride and groom lost everything and had ended their wedding day in a hospital casualty department needing treatment for shock. The hotel guests were at first reluctant to leave. There was sheer disbelief that this sort of outrage would have returned to Northern Ireland. And the bomb was huge, the blast echoing over the town of Enniskillen. It's a sad day for Enniskillen. We're only too well, well aware that the tragedy that occurred in this town in 1987 uh, and I'm sure of the efforts uh, that have been made to recover from that and to heal the wounds of the community. The good sense of the hotel staff saved lives but the newly renovated building is wrecked and the area's important tourist trade will suffer. Whoever planted the bomb stealing the vehicle in Dublin ten days ago knew how to plan a large-scale killing. Kate Aidy, BBC News, Enniskillen. The Irish Prime Minister John Bruton said it was clear the bombers didn't care how many people could have been killed. And politicians close to the loyalist paramilitaries warned that their ceasefire was under severe strain. This afternoon, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Sir Patrick Mayhew, held a crisis meeting with senior police and army officers in Belfast. Irish Republicans marching today in West Belfast continue to be bitterly angry about the decision to allow Orangemen to parade at Portadown. But Sinn Féin believes the IRA denial of involvement in the Enniskillen bomb and claims there are sinister motives behind the attack. Whoever the authors of this are, or whoever admits responsibility for it, that I remain entirely and I think justifiably suspicious that it happened at this time. The timing is so fortuitous for the British government and for the unions. So the question is, if not the IRA, then who? Some security sources believe people associated with a small group called Republican Sinn Féin, seen at a rally here, might be involved. 
Republican Sinn Féin split from Gerry Adams' party in the 80s and recently has been consistently hostile to the peace process. Last November, the discovery of a van load of explosives just south of the Irish border was linked to the group. Whatever the true identity of the bombers, the government is horrified. The fact that nobody was seriously injured or killed I don't believe was the intention of those who planted the bombs and I condemn outright the resumption of what appears to be bombing in Northern Ireland. I hope it isn't the resumption of a full campaign of bombing. If it is, the British government stands very firmly resolved to deal with that with all the resources at its disposal. The key question now is what the loyalist response might be and whether the IRA's denial will make any difference to the likelihood of retaliation. Well, I think if it breaks down, you know, I think that uh, we will fall into a hole that deep. We'll never be able to get out of it again. And I think that, uh, you know, the last 25 years when 3,000 odd people were killed, it'll be worse than that. Whoever its authors were, the Enniskillen Hotel bomb represents a serious escalation in an already grave situation. Resisting a slide into yet more terrible violence will require cool heads and wise counsel. Unfortunately, both are in short supply at the moment. Mark Devonport. BBC News, Belfast. Government scientists believed an accident at the Greenham Common Air Base nearly 40 years ago resulted in extensive radioactive fallout in the area, according to a leaked Ministry of Defence document. The Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, who obtained the papers, say the government tried to cover up the incident. The Ministry of Defence says the scientists were wrong and there was no nuclear weapon involved in the accident. Today, Greenham Common Air Base is being converted into an industrial park, the American Air Force and their nuclear weapons having pulled out of here after the end of the Cold War. But in the 1950s, Greenham Common was a key component of the West's nuclear strike force. On February the 28th, 1958, during an exercise at the base, a B-47 bomber like this one caught fire. It was thought to have been carrying a nuclear bomb, which burnt in the blaze. The government denied this, but three years later, scientists from the nearby Aldermaster Nuclear Weapons Research Establishment discovered alarmingly high levels of uranium-235 in the surrounding countryside. In a secret report, they concluded that this was probably fallout from the fire. A map showed radioactive contamination spreading out from the airbase to cover most of neighbouring Thatcham and Newbury. They discovered uh, samples of uranium which were a hundred times more than the total discharges of Aldermaston to date. In a statement today, the MOD acknowledged the report but said that it drew conclusions which we do not believe are substantiated. The 1958 accident at Greenham Common, it said, did not involve nuclear weapons. Despite the intervening years, those living near the base still remember the fire and the frantic reaction it caused among the American troops. They're supposed to be very brave, these Americans, but I think they panicked that day. It may have happened 38 years ago, but the first thing that local people will want to know is whether the soil and the atmosphere around this base still contain any radiation from this incident. The local MP says that it could have been the cause of a number of unexplained leukaemia cases in the area. The difficulty with these things is it's very hard to prove that sort of a link. All one can look at is the probabilities, and the probability that if you've got a high number of leukemias in this area, and that there probably was some sort of an accident, well, clearly there's likely to be a link. Greenham Commons nuclear forces may have gone, but they have left a legacy which could continue to haunt this place for years to come. Tom Carver, BBC News, Greenham Common. The Princess of Wales has asked for understanding from the media following the announcement that her divorce is to go ahead. She issued the plea after being persistently followed by reporters and photographers yesterday. On the eve of the divorce hearing, Prince Charles has arrived in Brunei to celebrate the Sultan's birthday. The Sultan sent his own plane to bring Prince Charles from Britain. Reclusive Brunei is off the regular tourist trail for the Prince, an ideal getaway. His host here, the world's richest man, the Sultan of oil-rich Brunei, is rumoured to earn more than $100 a second. The Prince is also here to help him celebrate his 50th birthday. Brunei's tropical rainforest is awesome but remote. Taking the Sultan's helicopter and then a longboat, the Prince will be in one of the most far-out jungle areas in the world. In the evening, there'll be a massive birthday party for the Sultan. A 20-acre amphitheatre is being built to stage a free concert. Michael Jackson has been flown in to top the bill. This site is part of a huge free funfair the Sultan is building as a gift to his people. 
It promises to be one of the most lavish 50th birthday parties of all time. A multi-million pound celebration to round off a day which could almost have been deliberately planned to take the Prince's mind off the problems back at home. David Willis, BBC News, Brunei. France has marked Bastille Day with the traditional military parade in Paris. The South African President Nelson Mandela was the guest of honour. For the first time, RAF planes took part in the flypast over the Champs-Élysées. It is the traditional annual display of French military pride and prowess. And for Jacques Chirac, an opportunity to forget his falling ratings in the opinion polls and hope some of the respect and affection his guest of honour, Nelson Mandela, enjoys in France might begin to rub off on him. This year's parade down the Champs-Élysées provided a spectacular backdrop for a unique display of Franco-British military cooperation. The RAF taking part for the first time in the flypast. A French refueling plane led a mixed British flight of tornadoes and harriers with a British VC-10 trailed by seven Mirage jets following them across the Paris skyline. Much more than an empty gesture, say both sides, they've set up a special joint unit to improve coordination still further. When German soldiers marched in this parade two years ago, it was seen as a signal of the closeness of Franco-German relations. The RAF's involvement in the flypast today is meant not just to advertise Franco-British military cooperation, but also to emphasize that links between France and Britain in general are close and becoming closer. Kevin Connolly, BBC News, Paris. The English Rugby Football Union is seeking urgent talks with the other countries in the Five Nations Championship to try to save the series. Last night, England was effectively thrown out of the championship because of its exclusive deal with Sky Television, worth £87.5 million. Ireland, Wales and Scotland say they won't play England for the next ten years because of it. Sky say they're standing by the agreement. The Canadian Jacques Villeneuve has won the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. Gerhard Berger finished second, with Finland's Mika Hakkinen third. Damon Hill crashed out of the race and is now only 15 points clear at the top of the championship. A familiar view from the starting grid for Damon Hill, but the clear track in front of him didn't last long. Relegated to fifth place before the first corner, Hill had consigned himself to playing catch-up. With Villeneuve pulling away at the front, it was now vital for Hill to make quick progress past the cars between him and his teammate. The early retirement of Michael Schumacher's Ferrari made that task look considerably easier. The world champion's engine had blown during the warm-up lap in France. At Silverstone, his car survived less than five minutes, locked in sixth gear. But Hill was still struggling to make an impact on the race. Hakkinen ahead of him was proving to be unpassable, and there was always a danger that the Williams driver's patience would snap. Instead, it was a wheel bearing that buckled under the pressure, but the end result was just the same. The Grand Prix that Hill had hoped would make the World Championship a formality had turned into Formula One's version of a royal walkabout and a victory procession for Jacques Villeneuve. The Canadian's win leaves him just 15 points behind Hill at the top of the Drivers' Championship. You tell everyone beforehand that you just, you just can't count on a 25-point you know, lead lasting for that long in the middle of a championship. It, uh, the way things go, you're going to have to have the old retirement here and there. Villeneuve's celebrations were dampened by news of an inquiry into the result, but the Canadian's victory was confirmed when Benetton's protests about his car were ejected. James Pierce, BBC News. The Olympic torch is approaching Atlanta, the city hosting the, this year's Games, after its journey across the United States. The torch will be used to light the Olympic flame, heralding the start of the Games later this week. The flame has been carried across the United States by the biggest team in Olympic history. Today, the name of hotel worker James Dick was added to the list of 10,000 torchbearers who've taken it from west coast to east. Even at four in the morning, the people of small town America turn out to wish them well. The torch relay has traveled along a 15,000 mile route within two hours driving time of 90% of the population. So those who will be watching the games on television, along with the rest of the world, can feel briefly part of the Olympic experience. The march through Georgia came to a temporary halt in the town of Swainsborough, 
whose proud citizens had arranged a welcoming party. We just wanted to be able to take part of the Olympics ourselves and feel like a part of it. It's very exciting. Probably never happen again here in Swainsboro, so we just wanted to be a part of it. Knowing that the flame was uh, originally lit in Greece, and now it's here in rural South Georgia, where nothing much ever happens except mosquitoes and rattlesnakes. You know, it's, it's kind of an event. The finishing line for the torch relay is at the Olympic Stadium in Atlanta, where the opening ceremony takes place on Friday. Neil Bennett, BBC News, at Swainsboro in Georgia. Tonight's main news again. The first bomb in Northern Ireland for two years has destroyed a hotel near Enniskillen. The IRA denied that they were involved. And there'll be a special edition of Panorama on the events of the last week in Northern Ireland and the consequences for the peace process tomorrow night at half past nine on BBC One. But that's all from the newsroom tonight. Good night. Hello, this may be the week that we look back and say that was summer 96. We still have a weak cold front to get rid of, but high pressure will dominate Britain's weather right throughout the coming week and perhaps even beyond. You can still see that uh, weather front on the satellite sequence, a breaking band of cloud in the south. There's still a fair bit of cloud in the north and the west, though. Most places that will have a clear night, a cool night in the north, a muggy, mild night in the south. Tomorrow, any cloud still in the south will gradually break up to give good sunny spells during the day. There'll be a lot of cloud in the north and northwest of Britain, but it'll be dry everywhere, and most places will have a good deal of sunshine due, with sea breezy developing around the coasts. Light winds inland, temperatures are on the coast, 17 to 19 Celsius, inland anywhere between 20 and 23 degrees Celsius. And the outlook beyond that for the rest of the week, temperatures gradually rising, essentially dry, essentially sunny. Look out for that warm sunshine, that hot sunshine during the course of the coming week. Good night. Inside Story is back on patrol in the city of glamour. I think stalking is a product of some of the ways we live our life. Hearing the truth behind the fear. I would say I don't want to be around you. I am no threat to her. The only way for me to heal myself is to leave. Watching the detectives police passion. I like to think we've saved uh, quite a few lives here in the city of Los Angeles. Inside Story, Stalking the Stalkers, Wednesday, 9.30 on BBC One. Take the phone up. There's film comedy now on BBC One. Has a spoiled socialite with a genius for being idle and rich finds herself firmly on the other side of the tracks. Goldie Horn and Kurt Russell are overboard.